I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about the United States military, AI, and autonomy efforts, we have with us Gregory C. Allen, who's the head of our Wadwani Center for AI and Advanced Technologies. Greg, it's so great to have you here again. This all came about because starting in late August, Dr. Kathleen Hicks, our former colleague here at CSIS, current Deputy Defense Secretary, announced what we call in the military a replicator initiative. What is this and what's the vision for it? The replicator initiative is getting a lot of attention and for very good reason. This is the Department of Defense embracing a vision of future defense technology that folks have been talking about and supporting in a long way, but never making the types of commitments that the Deputy Secretary Hicks made in these two speeches. She's talking about literally thousands of attributable autonomous systems operating in all domains and being specifically the heart of the effort to deter a conventional war with the People's Republic of China. So autonomous systems and AI and DOD is something we've been talking about for a really long time. Uh, I think everybody remembers when then Deputy Secretary of Defense Bob Work announced the third offset strategy, which talked about autonomous systems in the mid-2010s, but never has a Deputy Secretary been talking about procuring thousands of systems and putting them into operational use in 24 months. I do think it's fair to call this announcement of the Replicator Initiative sort of a step change in the seriousness with which DOD is viewing both autonomous systems and also the type of autonomous systems. She's really focused on what are called attributable autonomous systems, which means that they're so cheap that you don't mind if you lose a lot of them. And that is sort of a paradigm shift for a Department of Defense that has been focused on expensive, exquisite platforms for many decades now. So, Greg, give me an example of just what it is we're talking about here. We're talking about the future of warfare, which, as you say, we've been discussing for quite some time, but this really involves artificial intelligence and autonomous weapons and autonomous systems. What are these that we're talking about? So I think to understand that, you have to understand the problem that the Department of Defense is trying to solve. And as defined by Deputy Secretary Hicks, the problem is that the the People's Liberation Army, the Chinese military, has an advantage in mass. More missiles, more ships, more people. And the Department of Defense is looking at how can they possibly solve that problem. And they're deciding that they're not going to solve that problem by building thousands of ships at a billion or $10 billion a pop. They're going to solve that problem by building thousands of ships at maybe $3 million a pop. And in order to have that sort of changed cost paradigm, you have to have these systems be derived, especially from commercial technology and involving more artificial intelligence that can be scaled rather than these systems that have to be human piloted or human controlled, whether that's in the cockpit or remotely, as in the case of most of the drones from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. We're talking about technology that doesn't require a lot of human effort. So what does that actually mean? Well, the human effort is going to be enormous in terms of building the technology. But in terms of the footprint for operating the technology, the hope is that it's going to be much, much smaller. So take, for example, you know, a Predator drone. Um, these drones were extensively used in U.S. operations in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and there's no pilot on board that aircraft. But there is a huge footprint of literally, you know, dozens or hundreds of people who are involved in maintaining that program on the ground, either remotely piloting it, driving the sensor system, maintaining the aircraft, on and on and on. And the goal is to get to something that has a much smaller human footprint and is considerably more autonomous. So if you think about a Predator drone, the front part of that, the sort of bulbous thing that sort of looks like a, a skull on the aircraft, that's actually containing a satellite dish where it's remotely piloted. That's how the human controller controls the aircraft. These new systems, and some of these are actually already in prototype testing, have no human pilot, either in the cockpit or on the ground. And they will potentially fight alongside human piloted, human controlled systems, but they are fundamentally autonomous. And they'll be performing their functions autonomously, whether that's an intelligent 
intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance function, or a logistics function, or a warfighting function, such as operational offensive strike. And this is just a really different way of doing business than the Department of Defense has done for many decades now. So let's talk about the warfighting part of it as opposed to the collection of intelligence part of it. What does this mean when we talk about autonomous warfighting capability? Does it mean that there's no human involvement in terms of the decision making? What does it actually mean? Well, I think that there will always be a human involved in the chain of command. I think the the Department of Defense has been very clear about that for quite some time now. But it's worth revisiting what the DOD policy is on autonomy in weapons systems. So that's Department of Directive 3000.09. It's actually more than a decade old now, but the department actually just updated it in January 2023. And that defines autonomy in weapon systems as opposed to autonomy in, say, an intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance system as one in which the system once acted activated can select and engage targets without further intervention required by the human operator. So once you turn that system on, uh, once it's activated, it can not only identify the targets, which heat-seeking missiles have done for many decades, is to maintain target lock, but it can actually select and engage those targets. I'm going to go strike that radar installation, and I'm going to go do it right now. That type of decision authority is what constitutes autonomous weapon systems in the Department of Defense. When I left the DOD in April 2022, no program had actually initiated the process for special approval to begin development of an autonomous weapon system. And when I was reading this policy, that was the first question that came to my mind was, oh, is there a program right now in the DOD that is proposing to go through 3000.09? Because for the most most impactful types of things that Deputy Secretary Hicks is talking about with this initiative, it seems extremely likely to me that you are going to uh, initiate or you're going to require that special uh, approval process from 3000.09. So when Dr. Hicks talks about this replicator initiative being a deterrent strategy, what does she mean by that? You talked about this a little bit at the onset of our conversation in terms of deterring China, but what is Dr. Hicks's vision for this? She talked about it in such a way that basically every time China is considering, you know, is today that we want to invade Taiwan or is today the day that we want to, for whatever reason, attack the United States or a United States ally, that they conclude, no, today is not a good day because they assess that they're going to lose. And she talks about Replicator Initiative being a part of U.S. deterrence in 2027, in 2035, in 2049 and beyond. But I think it really gets to... What is the future of conventional, meaning non-nuclear, military superiority? And I think Secretary Hicks is identifying that the war in Ukraine shows that there is this opportunity to use cheap, commercially derived systems in order to um, destroy or even just hold at risk expensive, exquisite systems. Think about, for example, how, you know, $3 million Russian tanks are being taken out by $1,000 consumer drones that are attached with an anti-tank grenade. Or think about the fact that you know Russian destroyers uh, are being held at risk by Ukrainian remotely piloted surface drones. So these are systems you know, that cost tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars that are potentially taking out systems that cost hundreds of millions of dollars. And so that, that sort of changing paradigm between cheap, intelligent, uh, and numerous versus expensive, exquisite, and, you know, with a massive uh, human labor pool behind it. I think we're sort of seeing a vision of the future in Ukraine. And the Department of Defense is essentially saying here, we've seen enough. We recognize that this is sort of a new paradigm of military force. And it is absolutely urgent for U.S. national security, for U.S. military superiority, that we master and we build this new future of conflict and future of military power. Given China's ability to mass produce things, um, is it going to be hard for us to produce more of this cheap stuff than they already have or that they're going to produce? That's a perfectly reasonable question. And I think it gets to, you know, what the sort of specialization is going to be in this ecosystem and what are the capabilities of these systems. So in Ukraine, you're sort of seeing 
two different types of cheap military systems going into effect. One would be that sort of $1,000 consumer drone that I mentioned. Well, in many cases, that's already built by a Chinese company. Um, so it's absolutely true uh, that uh, Chinese companies already have a good head start in these types of initiatives. But I would point to sort of a different example, maybe the Ghost Shark, which is an autonomous submarine being built by Andrel's uh, Australia subsidiary for the Australian military. And that's a system that is currently, you know, estimated to cost about $23 million per system, which sounds pretty expensive until you remember that, you know, a nuclear attack submarine, which Australia is also purchasing as part of the AUKUS initiative, is $18 billion. Big more, difference. Yeah, more than 700 times more expensive. And so even when you're having several orders of magnitude, like literally more than 700 times cheaper, there's still a lot of secret sauce engineering that can make a difference when it comes to conflict. You know, that's especially true in the undersea domain where U.S. technology has always been extraordinary. But there's plenty of other places where that's true as well. I would point to, for example, the, the space domain, where who's actually in the lead when it comes to putting up thousands of low-cost but high-performing satellites? It's a U.S. company, SpaceX, um, and China is actually playing catch-up in that regard. So I think the theory here, and it will require you know appropriate execution, is that the sort of U.S. industrial base you can point to examples where we can absolutely do this well. Um, and if the programs are managed well, if the DOD sort of figures out how to get out of its own way, then there absolutely is an opportunity to win here. Greg, we've often talked about ethics and ethical concerns when it comes to AI, you and I on this podcast. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between AI and autonomous, which you've pointed out. What are some of the ethical concerns, though, when we discuss autonomous weapons and the mass production of them? Sure. So I think it's worth just pointing out that there are some folks out there who simply believe that autonomous weapons are by their very nature immoral, right? As in the fact that a human is not involved in selecting and engaging targets, even if a human gave the order, you know, to deploy the system and turn it into war fighting mode, et cetera, et cetera, that that is somehow unethical regardless of its consequences. And I think the U.S. Department of Defense has a different uh, impression of what it means to be ethical. You know, they would say, well, is this system going to lead to uh, fewer American warfighters being put in harm's way? Is this system going to improve the ability of the United States to protect itself and its allies? Is this system going to, you know, reduce civilian casualties or other things? You know, those types of questions are the ones that would, you know, primarily determine whether or not the use of the system could be ethical. I would point to, for example, the history of smart weapons. You know, the Terminator movies are actually born out of, you know, not the modern AI revolution, but the AI revolution of the 1980s when, you know, heat-seeking missiles and other types of sort of early stage digital digital weapons, so-called smart bombs, were really prominent in the public consciousness. And there was a lot of people who were saying that those weapon systems were unethical, as though, you know, dropping dumb bombs was somehow ethically, you know, superior to using precision-guided munitions that had a lot more onboard computational power. And I think that story is probably likely to play out here again, because smart bombs can be used ethically, or they can be used unethically. Right. The Russian military uses smart weapons to precisely target hospitals or to precisely target, you know, civilian infrastructure. So what they, I think what the Department of Defense would say is, you know, of course, there is a way to pursue increased autonomy in military systems that would be unethical. We're not going to do that. And we are committed to putting in place the technical safeguards and the procedural safeguards and the policy safeguards to ensure that we do this the right way. But we're also committed to ensuring U.S. national security and military superiority. Greg, finally, I want to ask you, you know, because sometimes when you talk about these things, there's a science fiction element of it, but it's really not science fiction and we have to pay for it. How is it going to be paid for? Oh, great question. So 
The timing of this initiative announcement is quite interesting. So Deputy Secretary Hicks originally announced the Replicator initiative in August 28th, almost exactly around the same time that the Department of Defense dropped its FY24 budget request. And readers of the FY24 budget request will notice that there is not a thing called Replicator initiative anywhere in that document. Deputy Secretary Hicks acknowledged that explicitly, and what she said is that this is actually not going to require a new program of record, it's not going to require uh, an increased budget, that the DOD is going to fund this through its existing budget. And she did not go into great detail as to what precisely that means, but there's a few things that I would point to. The first is that there are already some DOD programs of record that are working in the same direction as what Deputy Secretary Hicks announced under the Replicator Initiative. So, for example, the Air Force XQ-58A Valkyrie is an autonomous aircraft, and the DOD has already stated that it's planning on building thousands of these at around a price point of $3 million. So there are existing activities in the military service programs of record or in uh, organizations like uh, the Strategic Capabilities Office, SCO, you could point to these initiatives, sort of put them all under one umbrella and be like, okay, that I guess is the replicator initiative. But there's another possibility here, which is that both versions of the defense appropriations bills the one that's currently in the House and the one that's currently in the Senate, include a big budget increase for the Defense Innovation Unit, DIU. And Deputy Secretary Hicks stated that the director of DIU, Doug Beck, is going to play a big part in this replicator initiative. So another way that potentially some money could find its way to this program is if that big DIU plus up comes through, and then a lot of that money ends up funding replicator-related programs. Greg. Fascinating discussion, and I'm sure one that we're going to continue to have. Thank you so much for being here and explaining what all this means. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 